Good morning, everybody. Um, Honorable Minister of Finance, Mr. Enoch Godongwana, our distinguished guest speakers, delegates, welcome to this year's Government Employees Pension Fund Annual Thought Leadership Conference. As you've just seen in that hugely embarrassing video, and as I look at my picture, I'm starting to look more and more like my father, he's 95. Um, uh, I've been in this business um, for a long time, radio and television, and I think the only reason why I have been invited today as the program facilitator is uh, because the organizers thought I was a pensioner. Um, I, I suspect this is part of... There's no need to applause, so that's even worse, okay? Um, I, I think it's probably part of some sympathetic outreach program as far as the fund uh, is concerned. We can debate that later. Although I do have to tell you, I'm not sure if there's anyone in the room who is with Discovery. Um, I'm sure there is, because they're everywhere. There we go. But um, thank you very much indeed for that little card that you sent me a while back confirming that I was of pensionable age. It gives me 10% at Builders Warehouse on a Wednesday, which is really good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this event takes place, and I think you will all uh, concur with me, uh, against an increasingly uncertain global environment. And the risks to the outlook, whether it be in South Africa or around the world, are overwhelmingly, as the International Monetary Fund said recently, tilted to the downside. Um, do I need to go through the list? The war in Ukraine, the impact of European gas imports from Russia, ongoing inflation concerns, debt distress in emerging markets and the developing economies, and always uh, the specter of uh, COVID-19 outbreaks, uh, as well as the geopolitical fragmentation that we are seeing each and every day. It is of great concern. At this point, I could pause and say, let's call the whole thing off. Buses are outside. We can go and tour wine farms, or we can continue talking. Folks, locally, uh, the government's economic reconstruction and development plan says this, and I quote, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic found a vulnerable South African economy having experienced two quarters of recession. As a result, the pandemic, quote, uh, deepened the economic crisis. Many people lost their jobs. Many have gone without income for extended periods. Many are going hungry every single day. The uh, preamble to the report went on to say inequality is expected to widen and poverty is expected to deepen. I would contend against that backdrop, although there have been improvements since that uh, was written, we now need new thinking and new strategies. To that effect, ladies and gentlemen, in the next day and a half, we are going to try and uh, be deeply interrogative if we can. We're going to look at the outlook for the global economy and financial markets post-COVID-19. We will look at navigating what is a deeply uncertain environment right now. And then, as we wrap up, we'll look at the challenges for pension fund administration and benefit management as a consequence of the impact of the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I do also want to acknowledge our partner in this important event, the World Bank, and a special welcome to Therese Couture, Director Asset Management and Advisory from the organization. I will call you up in just a moment, Therese. But uh, to start proceedings this morning, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Musa Mabessa, Principal Executive Officer at the Government Employees Pension Fund. Honorable Minister of Finance, Mr. Enoch Kodongwana, Chairperson of the GPF Board of Trustees, Mr. Dondo Mohajan, the Deputy Chairperson of the GPF Board, Mr. Edi Kakana, Trustees of the GPF Board of Trustees, Director of Asset Management and Advisory, which is the RAMP program at the World Bank Treasury, Ms. Therese Couture, Esteemed guests, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. On behalf of the Government Employees Pension Fund and the World Bank, I express my appreciation to each and every one of you for attending the fourth edition of the GPF Thought Leadership Conference. 
In today's busy and hectic world, we appreciate you taking the time and effort to join us. The GPF thanks you for your willingness to share your ideas and expertise with us. As the GEPF, we believe that the answers to the challenges facing the pension fund industry can be met through collaboration and innovation by all the role players in the industry. It is our belief that by bringing together knowledge, experience from across the globe will yield a unique combination of strengths and insights in the pension industry and prepare the industry for a better tomorrow. It is for the above reasons that the GEPF, in partnership with the World Bank Treasury, is hosting this Thought Leadership Conference today. We hope that you will contribute to making the conference to be all that you expect it to be, and that you will take the opportunity to make new friends, renew old acquaintances, and make contact with decision makers and partner for your continued success. I'm not going to take any more of your time, so let's get on with the program. We look forward to your engagement. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, just before I call the Honorable Minister of Finance to the podium, uh, Therese, can I ask you to uh, join me on the podium just to say a few word words of uh, welcome? Ladies and gentlemen, the Director, Asset Management and Advisory at the World Bank Treasury, uh, Therese Kutua. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning, Mr. Godangwana, Chairperson Mogawane, Principal Executive Officer Mabessa, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome all of you to the Pension Thought Leadership Conference, which the GEPF and the World Bank Treasury will co-host for the coming two days. It is my sincere pleasure and honor to be here today. We are especially delighted to partner and collaborate again with the GEPF for the first in-person conference in almost three years since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in early 2020. I would like to thank Mr. Moga Wane, the GEPF Chairperson of the Board of Trustees, and Mr. Musa Mabessa, Principal Executive Officer of the GPF, for giving us the opportunity to co-organize this event. We greatly appreciate the GEPF Senior Management for facilitating a global dialogue among leaders of the pension industry, promoting knowledge sharing, and providing a platform for thought-provoking discussions and greater opportunities to build relationships and collaborate. We have approximately 300 experts and participants assembled over the next two days to discuss pertinent issues and the outlook for global financial markets, as well as challenges in pension uh, management. GPF is Africa's largest pension fund with more than 1.2 million active members and serving over 450,000 pensioners and beneficiaries. Over the last decade, GPF's investment portfolio increased significantly, reaching over 2 trillion South African rands as of March 2021, and its average net return on investment over that period was strong, recording above 8%. As a founding signatory to the UNPRIs, the GPF has continued to demonstrate its commitment to responsible investment and has committed 5% of its total portfolio for developmental investment purposes. As you may know, the World Bank Treasury's Reserve Advisory and Management Partnership, better known as RAMP, has partnered with official sector pension and social schemes for more than 15 years. RAMP supports pension funds and plan sponsors in devising and enhancing their governance structures and investment policies. RAMP further promotes robust asset management practices, enabling them to maximize risk-adjusted returns that are in line with the pension's risk tolerance and asset liability structure. Sound governance structures and investment policies coupled with strong asset management practices will allow pension fund managers to fulfill their fiduciary responsibilities and ultimately protect the best interest of plan members and beneficiaries. A robust and financial sustainable public pension system makes it possible for people to plan their future financial needs 
and foster security for individuals that leads to stability for society. It is therefore one of the key requirements for the development and prosperity of a modern economy. Let me take this opportunity to briefly touch on some of the challenges that public pension funds face these days, such as high inflation, central banks' hawkish monetary tightening, a rising interest rate environment, climate change, and environmental, social, and governance investing, better known as ESG. After more than a decade of struggling to bring inflation to target, central banks now encounter a much more challenging environment. The shift in the inflationary environment has been remarkable. Inflation has hit its highest level in decades in many countries. For example, U.S. inflation recorded 9.1% this June, which was a 40-year high, and 8.3% in August, which triggered this past Tuesday the worst tumble in S&P 500 since June 2020. And UK inflation reached a new 40-year high of 10.1% in July of this year. The pace of price increases has spiked as supply disruption from the pandemic collided with high consumer demand fueled by unprecedented fiscal and monetary support. As well, the devastating invasion of Ukraine by Russia has further triggered significant price increases in energy and agricultural products as the West imposed significant economic sanctions on Russia. High inflation is a serious threat to total retirement incomes and pension schemes as well. Fixed income, fixed income investors stand to lose much from high inflation. The capital value and current income streams of fixed income investments shrinks in real terms and tend to underperform equities when price levels are rising fast. A vicious cycle of high inflation and interest rates could create a bear market for a fixed income investment. And if the cycle continues with a recession, equity investments will be hit significantly with a potential adverse impact on the financial sustainability of pension schemes. To combat inflation, central banks are embarking on a more hawkish monetary policy stance to ensure inflation does not become more deeply embedded in the global economy. A month ago, in the first face-to-face -face Jackson Hole meeting in two years, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell indicated that another unusually large interest rate increase could be appropriate at the next meeting after two such increases in June and July. He also stated that the Fed is likely to keep raising interest rates, eventually at a slower pace, and leave them elevated for some time to restore price stability. And many other central bank governors have signaled their intention to continue tightening their monetary policy. At the same time, it is likely that the significant tightening of monetary policy will have adverse economic impacts. While central banks will have to continue to raise rates to combat inflation, its effectiveness may be limited as the inflation has triggered, was triggered through supply side shocks. We have been witnessing the adverse impacts of rapidly rising interest rates with both fixed income and global equity markets selling off significantly as market participants adjust their expectations. Climate change and its effects on the global economy have become a generation-defining challenge for public asset managers, including pension funds. The global discussion about climate change has also led to an increased awareness about policy operations and their impact on the financial system. It has become critical for investors to incorporate environmental, social, and governance elements into their investment decisions. In addition, investors increasingly increasingly consider ESG factors to assess expected risk and return investments beyond the use of traditional financial metrics. Let me conclude with the following question. How do we navigate this challenging environment as public pension asset managers? I believe further enhancing diversification across asset classes, reviewing risk management practices, and strengthening communication to stakeholders while maintaining a longer-term and holistic, holistic perspective becomes even more important during these turbulent times. I strongly feel that this Thought Leadership Conference will provide all of us with an excellent opportunity to discuss these challenges and policy options for public pension asset managers. We have a wonderful agenda with a stellar lineup of speakers for the coming two days, including panels on the outlook for the global economy and financial markets 
against the backdrop of COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine, navigating an uncertain environment, opportunities and challenges in private debt and equity investments, and the global environment and energy transition with, with its challenges and opportunities for pension fund investment. Again, let me extend my warmest welcome to you. I look forward to fascinating and formative discussions over the next two days. Thank you so much. Therese, thank you very much indeed. As someone who has been a frontline journalist for many, many years, uh, one of the great joys of my life is to watch the symbiotic relationship between uh, political, the political side of government and the mechanistic side of government, the administrative side of government. Um, all the speakers last night were very privileged to attend a, a, a cocktail function, and I had uh, a great deal of pleasure in watching the relationship between the now chairperson of the Government Employees Pension Fund, but previously with the Treasury, uh, Dondo Mokhojani, and the Finance Minister, Enoch Godungwana. What did they say? Who holds the balance of power? Who listens to whom? What's the priority when it comes to setting agendas? I know some of that now, having witnessed the two of them last night. But if you ask me for more, you're going to have to kill me. Dondo, it's always a great pleasure to, uh, to see you and to welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, the chairperson of the Government uh, Employees Pension Fund, uh, Dondo Mohojani. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, and thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, Minister of Finance, Mr. Gorongwana, uh, Therese uh, you know, from the World Bank, Mr. Kekana, uh, the Deputy Chair of the GPF, I must recognize you because if not, I'll be in trouble with Musa. Trustees of the GPF Board, uh, Musa and Mr. Stoller, esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this beautiful Cape Town. I think, uh, you know, you brought good weather to Cape Town and your presence here is, is much appreciated. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and Management of the Fund, we welcome you to our Thought Leadership Conference. A special word of appreciation to the Minister. Thank you, Minister, for agreeing. We know you are in a lockdown period right now, uh, but we hope to get a scoop of what you're going to say in the next four weeks. And please, please, when you come upstage, share with us uh, what you're going to say uh, on, in, uh, during the medium-term budget policy statement coming in October. A special thank you, uh, Therese, to the World Bank for the continued support, and we really appreciate that as a GPF in partnering and actually putting a conference like this together. When I look at the program, ladies and gentlemen, we have over the next two days, this first installment of this Thought Leadership Conference once again, once again meets the objectives of the fund to stimulate dialogue amongst the leaders in the global pension industry. And we are pleased that this year we have again attracted leading pension funds, experts in pension fund investment and economic policy decision makers in Africa and across the globe. Your continued support of the GPF and this conference is greatly appreciated. It is our hope that the conference will provide a forum to embrace knowledge, share knowledge sharing, and prompt thought-provoking leadership discussions to source solutions to the challenges facing, facing the pension, uh, pension sector. Ladies and gentlemen, the economic and social fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic coupled with global uh, geopolitical tensions has put the rest of the notion that the global financial crisis of 2008-09 was once in a lifetime event. The stock market f fall of March 20, 2020 was even steeper and faster than, uh, than our experience of the global financial crisis. And the human cost associated with COVID-19 and turmoil has cost much and this must not be underestimated. Our new reality does, however, provide us with an opportunity to, think, to rethink how an industry we have been operating in, whether it be sustainable for our benefit structures, pension design, or how we invest the funds we are entrusted with. I believe for long we have been comfortable with the same. It is for this reason that we at the GPF decided that this year's conference will explore the challenge 
challenging areas of the impact of the geopolitical landscape, the global economic outlook, using diversification and the strategic asset allocation for pension funds to navigate a challenging outlook for markets with high stress levels of sovereign debt, inflation pressures, rising interest rates, and geopolitical uncertainty. The outlook and trends and sustainable governance arrangements for private debt and private equity investments for pension funds. And finally, navigating the challenges for pensions fund administration and benefit management as a consequence of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a GPF, ladies and gentlemen, we are excited that we can converse such diverse opinions to find solutions to achieve excellence in the industry. Through the series of keynote addresses and panel discussions from participants across the globe, moderated by leading experts in their relevant subject matters, we hope your deliberations will define excellence in patient fund administration and source solutions generate business and connect with new and existing pension networks. We hope the conference will live up to the vision of being a unique opportunity for creating networks, generating business opportunities, knowledge sharing and robust discussions with some of the leading world experts in the pension and investment industries. A conference like this one gives us a wider perspective to appreciate the value of our institutions. It provides a prism to view our various facets, our many bits and pieces, and most significantly, it offers a window for discerning vital forces that animate our organizations. A conference like this, ladies and gentlemen, also helps us to take pride in looking back at our past, while at the same time living the now. From past insights are drawn. The present is a new starting point. The future holds the next finish line. We all know, ladies and gentlemen, that the past in South Africa, what the past in South Africa means for us. The GPF as well as the PIC has to ensure that transformation and advancement of black people does not take back the back banner. We have to ensure that this is our main focus. Pension funds like ours, taking into account our history in South Africa, should be at the forefront of very uncomfortable debates. If you look at the banking sector, just one sector as an example, in South Africa, after 28 years, we forgot what black-based black, broad broad -based black economic empowerment and the advancement of, black, of, of women mean in general. Let me divert, ladies and gentlemen, and give you some facts. Out of 30 registered banks, just banks only in South Africa, 18 CEOs are white males and only six African. Out of a total of 28 bank CFOs, 23 or so are white, five Indian males, zero Africans, no women. Looking at chief risk officers in the banking sector in South Africa, there are 17 white males, three African males and one colored, no women. There is something very wrong here. This is at a very high level and I guess, ladies and gentlemen, if you have to dig deeper into various critical decisions making committees in these institutions, the situation is much, much worse. Ministers and colleagues, this cannot be correct. Black people can read, black people can write, and black people can count. If banks are committed to inclusive growth and transformation of the economy, as per one of the BASA reports uh, I have read indicated, then let's see action and serious commitment. This is not what I'm saying, reckless rhetoric to talk about these issues. The GPF will use its muscle and influence to ensure that what I'm talking about happens. Sectors and institutions that do not agree with this, on these matters that I've outlined, among many, will fall off the GPF bus. Once again, let me stress, we want this conference to be a platform which stimulates dialogue on the challenges facing the global pension industry. The conference will, I hope, with no fear or favor, deliberate on the importance of governance in the pursuit of excellence, which must be always guided by values and strategic priorities. As a GPF, we believe that those of you gathered here have the knowledge and know-how to tackle these challenges of improving the sustainability of pension funds while seeing the members and pensioners as a legitimate, responsible guardian of their retirement benefits. Let us remember that what we share and discuss must be motivated 
by the need for excellence for the pension fund sector and for the sake of its sustainability and its future. Let us assist and support each other, share information and coordinate our efforts in the pursuit of excellence and in making good on our promises of good governance to our people. I trust that this annual thought leadership conference will come up with viable ways of reinforcing our commitment to growing the wealth of our members and in, the, in pursuit of excellence. I wish you all the best of success in your deliberations over the next two days. Enjoy the conference and I thank you. Uh, Dondo, thank you very much indeed. We did say you were going to learn a lot more during this conference. There was nugget number one. We have a whole new category. I think you called it, Dondo, broad braised economic empowerment. Uh, that means the empowerment is well cooked, which I think is important. Folks, if I was a betting man, um, which I'm not, um, I would say that you have absolutely no chance at all of hearing anything about what is going to appear in the medium term budget, but then I might be wrong. I don't know. Someone said to me the other day, who's got the tougher job in South Africa? Is it the finance minister or the chief executive officer of ESCOM? You can make up your mind. Uh, what I can tell you is that we do have a, uh, a reconstruction plan, but as many commentators have said, it needs to be underpinned by ongoing economic reform, competition, and higher productivity. The risk factors are a whole lot greater. I think it was the finance minister who in a speech recently said, that uh, more heavy lifting is needed. Well, that heavy lifting is continuing and will continue to be in place for some time. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome South Africa's Minister of Finance, the Honorable Mr. Enoch Godongwana. get challenged. Uh, program Director, Jeremy Max, Chairperson of the Government Employees Pension Fund, uh, and former DG of National Treasury, Mr. Dondo uh, the principal officer of the Government Employees Pension Fund, Mr. Musa Mabasa, Theresa uh, Kotra, the director, asset management and advisor at the World Bank Treasury, who happens to be Canadian. I had an interesting discussion with her last night because uh, as a student of public finance, one of the areas I've tried to understand, an interesting thing to understand uh, is the Canadian public uh, finance management and key themes there is healthcare and the intergovernmental fiscal relations arrangement. There's quite an interesting understanding. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to address this year's annual Thought Leadership Conference. I think gathered here are practitioners and stakeholders in an industry that is vital source of economic growth given its role as an intermediary in the investment savings channel. This industry is also one of the most important providers of liquidity uh, needed to ensure the smooth functioning of capital markets. Uh, I, I'm told, I can't remember what the numbers are, that's staggering as to how much savings in this economy are, but you can't channel, you can't see that into productive uh, capacity. We need to have a discussion about that. So I've structured my 
kind of my presentation in this way. Uh, the first thing I need to do, uh, which people normally expect to a minister of finance, is to talk about the economy, both global and domestic. The assumption is that uh, a minister of finance should understand those things, but it doesn't mean I do. <laughs> but I'm working on that, on that assumption. The third area I want to deal with is climate change and its implications for the pension fund investment industry. And I'll conclude by my expectations of what this industry should do in the context of infrastructure funding in this economy. That's important if you, those who understand the South African uh, political economic debate. Uh, uh, there are some of us who think that the best way to deal with this question is prescribed assets. So it's quite important that uh, I deal with this. So we are meeting at an unprecedented uh, challenging environment uh, from a geopolitical perspective. Ours is an increasingly multipolar uh, world. As a consequence, we are witnessing global supply chains are being reconfigured, leading to possible disruptions which could negatively affect established global trade agreement, um, uh, agreements. The weakening of multinational institutions could make it difficult to build global consensus and solidarity on the challenges facing humanity. The war between Russia and Ukraine has increased the geopolitical risks. By the way, I tabled my budget on the 23rd of February. The following morning on the 24th, I went to an interview with the SABC. And as I go back to the office, Dr. Duncan Peters, one of the de de Deputy Director General, says, when I get to the office, says, Mr. Minister, your numbers have changed. Because I've made my speech the following day. He said, I said, why? He said, Russia has attacked Ukraine. So, budget my budget, 23rd, 24th, Russia attacks Ukraine. Uh, so, the United Nations has warned of signs of, of a wave of economic, social, and political upheaval that will leave no country untouched. It is important for South Africa to heed this warning. The Russian-Ukraine conflict and subsequent sanctions against Russia have renewed the surge in global inflation, weighing on global demand. Higher inflation is eroding purchasing power. It has also led to higher interest rate, discouraging and delaying investment and employment creation. Collectively, these factors are determining the near-term and long-term economic growth. In its most recent focus, the International Monetary Fund cuts its 20 22 global economic growth forecast to 3.2 from an estimated 3.6. The global lender cited a worse than anticipated slowdown in China, further COVID-19 outbreaks and lockdowns, and critically further negative spillover from the war in Ukraine. Among emerging market and developing economies, growth is projected to fall from 6.6% in 2021 to about 3.4% in 2022. This is well below the annual average of 4.8% over the period 2011 to 2019. The negative spillovers from the war in Ukraine will more than offset any near-term benefits from higher energy prices in some commodity exporters. 
Forecasts for 2022 growth have also been revised down in nearly 70% of emerging market and developing economies. On the domestic front, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is a powerful example of how economies are integrated. As I indicated on the 23rd, I did make this uh, my budget. The following morning, uh, I got the, that message. The consequence of this escalation, including sanctions imposed on Russia, gravely impacted on our assumptions on the domestic out outlook. The conflict has created a new set of multidimensional risks to our economy, uh, economic outlook and for fiscal and monetary policy. It has also exacerbated the supply chain bottlenecks that emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic. Equally, it has raised inflationary pressures through higher energy and food prices, leading to a rapid tightening of monetary policy while adding to fiscal pressures. Between February and June, the petrol price nearly doubled, putting immense pressures on the already stretched incomes of South Africans. I must say, in the light of that, we were forced to make some subsidies, which have ended in August this year. Inflation has jumped to 13-year high. Headline consumer inflation rose significantly in, 2020, in July 2022 to 7.8. This compares to an average of 6.2 in the first half of 2022. Furthermore, increasing inflationary pressures and rising interest rates have had disposable income, disrupted efforts to lower poverty, negatively impacting consumer spending, economic growth, employment creation, and food security. We've already seen the impact of these developments on the latest GDP numbers. Following the more positive really, uh, GDP out outcomes in the first quarter of 2022, Second quarter growth shrank by 0.7%. Notable household spending also slowed. This, of course, is a result of two uh, issues. The first one is unprecedented load shedding that we experienced in the, in the second quarter. And secondly, the floods, which have had an impact on the, on the on on the economy. So just last week, our external account turned negative for the first time in a long while. While commodity prices have begun to fall, the price of coal, one of our largest exports, continues to rise. Let me just say, despite all of these negative aspects of the Ukraine conflict, um, we benefited a lot on, as a result of commodity prices. Uh, we pocketed with about 198 billion run, uh, revenue over run in the last financial year. We're still doing well, by the way. Uh, we're not bad. Uh, but you don't tell in the politics, I'm told you don't tell your boss that. So the president doesn't, doesn't have to know that I'm still doing well. <laughs> so... Uh, were it not for the problems we faced on the logistic front, we probably would have pocketed another 20 billion more on the revenue side. As we have indicated, the downward, uh, downward risk then has been the, uh, these case that flooding and load shedding. As I the conflict, as well as other risks which are beginning to materialize, will put pressure on the fiscal space in developing countries such as South Africa. The IMF also conscious that tighter global financial conditions could induce debt distress in emerging markets and developing economies. More aggressive interest rate acts by major central banks have already prompted capital outflows from emerging markets, raising fears of economic contraction in, in the near term. Slower growth in China's economy as well as lower global growth means lower external demand, 
threatening the pace of economic recovery in South Africa. The Russian-Ukraine conflict has also highlighted the pressing need for our economic and fiscal policy to be responsive to changes in the geopolitical landscape. As I turn to the climate challenge issues, as we meet at this conference, the winds of change have begun to blow within the pension industry. As part of this change, the industry is charged with the enormous responsibility to ensure that capital flows towards not only economic returns, but also social impact. This presents both opportunities and risk. I'm sure that many of these risks are well known to you. Allow me then to focus on the opportunities that I think climate change presents to the industry. Specifically, I would like to talk about the role that the institutional investors can play in enabling the African continent to transition to more resilient and sustainable economies and prepare for climate-driven events and catastrophes. Let me just pause a bit. Pause a bit. If you look at the floods in KZ, they are a repeat of what happened in 2019. I repeat of what happened in 2019, but if you look at this year, they came back with visions. What does that mean for us, for strategy and thinking as South Africans? What it means, first and foremost, it means that we've got to internalize that climate change is here with us. That's the first thing we've got to do. We've got to internalize that. The second thing we've got to do is how do we develop an appropriate response? I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So that's the reality we've got to uh, uh, think about, internalize in, in, in a... So in March this year, the African Development Bank estimated that South Africa would require 30 billion US dollars. That is approximately 522 billion rands to finance just energy transition. Now, Daniel Minello is sitting here in front row, is working on what is called the five developed economies promised us 8.5 US dollars. Uh, that's his task. Uh, but if you look at the amount of this figure, it does think that we ourselves have got to say, how do we as a nation respond to this issue? We cannot be saying to deal with climate change, we're going to rely on handouts. We've got to rethink how are we changing also our fiscal strategy to talk to this issue. That's a critical challenge that we're going to face. And just give just an example. If we are going to start thinking about decommissioning coal-fired power stations, 13 of these coal-fired power stations and 13 of those mines are in one region, Mpumala. Are in one region, Mpumala. What does that mean for Mpumala and the kind of dislocation you are likely to would be associated with us. What that means, what that means we've got to think about is not only about uh, moving towards a clean uh, environment, but also think about an alternative development model. What kind of economic activity in the context of moving away from these 13 power stations, from these 13 mines, what kind of economic activity you must think about from Pumala? What that requires, it requires a thinking about a, a different development model. So pension funds have got to play a critical role in this regard. As we have indicated, we're seeing that. 
In all these cases, the infrastructure has shown itself as insufficient to withstand the new normal. So we've got to change, think about changing the infrastructure as well. So pension funds can play a critical role in this regard. As we we're still leveraging now on the COP26 promises, we need to be thinking what else. What that means is therefore we've got to think about the role of our pension funds in the infrastructure space. So, we've got to think about how the, the, the pension funds invest in this infrastructure space. Now, uh, let me tell you any, uh, now, the debate has been crude in South Africa and saying, oh, the pension funds don't want to invest or the, or the institutional, the, the entire financial sector doesn't want to, invest and therefore the appropriate response must be uh, prescribed assets. Uh, I've been kind of a lone voice in my, in my own uh, home, which is my political body, trying to say, no, hello, oh, hang on, hang on. The problem is not that the pension funds and, the, and insurances and all of those people do not want to invest. The challenge is that we have not created appropriate instruments. We have not created appropriate instruments which will allow these institutions to invest in this infrastructure. The World Bank estimates that uh, Looking at Sub-Sahara, uh, you need massive investment. In their study in 2009, looking at the infrastructure gap and using that as a baseline. Uh, so closing that infrastructure gap, uh, the African Development Bank thinks that we need to spend between 130 to 107 billion US dollars per annum in closing that. In South Africa, the amount needed to finance both brown and greenfield infrastructure projects totals in the region of one trillion over the next five years. Put differently, South Africa needs to lift the level of fixed investment in the economy to at least 30% of GDP from the current levels of about 19% of GDP. So, government, we cannot close this gap alone. We cannot close this gap alone. We're talking about, for instance, uh, national health insurance. For us to meet the requirements of national health insurance, we've got to improve our institutions health facilities by 194 billion rand. That's the 2019 study. If you include, add in uh, the Carlison course from, that was a figure quoted from 2019, 994 billion rand, just for health facilities. So what that means, we need to have a conversation between ourselves, all of you here. Yeah. Now, what that means, I must create good instruments for you to put the money. I'll do that uh, so that we should avoid my colleagues who are saying, let's make prescribed assets, okay? I'm helping you. So that's a challenge that we need to be talking about. Uh, It is that investment that's going to be required. I'll fine tune this thing. Donors, they have put some restrictions. When I was not in treasure, 
when I was in the party, I would wake up and say anything I want to say. But treasury has got constraints. Particularly in this period, I've got a month between now and the medium term budget policy statement. So they've got, uh, they say it's a closed period. I'm restricted in what I can say between now and then. But I'm giving you pointers. I'm giving you pointers that you need to be sharpening your pencils and say how are you going to put money in investing and in helping government to improve all our facilities. Now, from our side, you may have some ideas uh, uh, on, on that. From our side, we want to create the necessary environment and create the best necessary instrument for that. One of the things we need to be changing. By the way, I had the privilege of being invited by uh, Elias Masalela here. He's chair of Sanlam board. So I was addressing the Sanlam board last week. And somebody said to me, which I didn't know, that the reason we can't make triple P's work is something called the Regulation 16. So I went back to the department and said, what is Regulation 16? Can you bring it? I want to scrap it. So we will improve and change that Regulation 16 in such a manner that we can they say in this current form, Regulation 16 makes it difficult to do triple plus. It took you six years to actually finalize the thing. So I can tell you now, Regulation 16 is gone, it's going to go. Because what you want to do is to be able to deliver the infrastructure at most. Um, so we will be placing before you, because both social and other, including infra, social infrastructure, we've got to find a way of bringing um, private sector to fund it. To fund it. But given that Daniel is looking at me here, I've got to say such an infrastructure must be climate resilient. I want to make sure that I conform to your prescriptions climate resilient. Uh, so, we are going to be inviting you to work with us in this regard, both from helping us in, I mean, we're struggling to do a number of things. If you ask me now, I've got 249 billion rand at all levels for municipality, to national municipalities, I've got 63 billion rand for infrastructure, provinces at 61 billion, Total is 249 billion. If I go outside the street, I can't see stop and go, I can't see cranes. Now, it seems there's something wrong with the execution and generation of, of the pipeline. That's something uh, we will be attending to. So, on the 26th, we need to say something about concretely what. It, what do you mean about what I'm saying about this infrastructure program? It also has got implications for our GDP figures. If you look at the GDP on the expenditure side of the GDP, you'll see the worst performing side, the government consumption. Uh, government consumption on the GDP expenditure side is your worst performer. So we need to improve that government consumption to, 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 to increase growth. So uh, we'll have some nice chat on the uh, 26th. Uh, so I've got to talk in general terms. Uh, Dondo and these people do not allow me to say all of these things. But let me just say, as I conclude, we, when Dondo left, we, I said, no, you can't escape. You are going to go to GPF. Now, he's got a mandate. Uh, I said, you've got a mandate. Among other things he's got to achieve, he's got to make sure that there's transformation in the sector. 
have got to leave, use the leverage we have at the biggest pension fund in the economy to achieve them. Uh, uh, let me just give an example. Uh, also, not only in terms of the demographics, but in, also in terms of funding. You, you know, if a black business person has got a nice project, it's 100 million rand, goes to Standard Bank, Standard Bank says, I'll give you 60 million rand, 40 million rand, a skin in the game. He told her, i 40 million. The skin in the game, you don't have 40 million. We've got to structure in, in the, in the funding in such a manner that those projects can get funding. So transformation in the industry is going to be a critical factor that mandate Dondo has. The second mandate Dondo has is to ensure that I can deliver on the infrastructure projects that I require. I've told them, together with the PIC, I don't care what they are going to say, if, if, even if they have not finished, I'll say something on the 26th of October on those issues that I've referred to here. It's their duty to fine tune what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say something on those issues. So, thank you for the opportunity. I wish you good deliberations. I hope that I'm stuck to the time. Politicians normally don't stick to the time. I remember I was asked to address enough coke in Mzamba, Eastern Cape. Poor souls, they wanted me to open for 10 minutes. I spoke for one hour, 10 minutes. Spoke for one time in 10 minutes. So in, just in summary, we would like to partner with the industries, financing this infrastructure on a massive scale. Now people then, I listen to bureaucrats, they say, ah, we'll start a new project in 2027. I said, I'll be gone by then. I've got a political cycle which ends in 2024. I've got to deliver now. Uh, on that infrastructure and, and leave uh, a footprint, even if I live in 2024. So that's the challenge Dondo has and, and, and his team. By implication, it applies to Abel Sitole, by the way, because it, it, it cascades from GPF into them. So uh, have some nice deliberations. Thank you very much.